I'm John Aaron. I uh, run the time of sale program for the city of Bloomington. And uh, this is a program that they put in in 1995 to maintain housing stock and uh, kind of address uh, other issues within that housing stock to keep it from going into um, a dilapidated state where they'd have to condemn or take down homes. And it's been working pretty good. You know, it's, it's a program that a lot of people don't really know what it's about. They don't, they don't like people to come through and tell them what's wrong with their house, but they appreciate it after we go through and, and point out a lot of things that do need to be corrected and things that are not really right with the house. They find that it's very beneficial. Uh, I've, pre I've uh, prepared a slideshow of what we look at. It doesn't always just involve uh, our department as far as building and inspection. It also involves utilities at some point, depending on the situation. It involves uh, our environmental health also. So there's, there's things that you'll come up with in your home when you're filling out your disclosure statements on what, what's in your house, your wells, sump pumps, water damage, all that. All that is intertwined with the time of sale. So some of the slideshows, I'll be able to uh, show you what, what we see, what we find within the home, and I'll explain all this stuff to you. So um, first off, I'll get out of your way so you can, uh, you can see this. Uh, this, is, uh, this is one of our handouts. This tells you everything you want to know about smoke detectors. It's available down at our uh, community development counter. It's got a lot of information. Carbon monoxide, also another handout that we've got downstairs at our community development counter. This is required within what the state statute requires within 10 feet of any bedrooms, or you could put them within each bedroom. We don't enforce carbon monoxide yet because it hasn't been introduced into building code. It's not a mandatory thing for us. Um, when it does become mandatory, that's when we'll start enforcing carbon monoxide. But it is a good idea to get it in place. The tighter we build our homes, the more they become important. Smoke detectors, there's many different models. There's hard wires, there's uh, battery operated. They're required in each bedroom and one on each level of the home. So locations of them, this one is uh, located right next to a ceiling fan. If there's any smoke that comes up, that ceiling fan will be able to blow that smoke away and never set off the detector. So placement of those things are pretty important for us. This tells locations. Um, fire extinguishers, you know, this, is, this was just a really good slide for us to kind of show locations, but fire extinguishers, we don't, we don't require them, but it's not a bad thing if you want to put them in your house, that's fine. Uh, Bedroom, bedroom hall, living room, we got them within the stairway. A CO detector downstairs is where they asked for them too. One in the basement. Uh, also a smoke. So this, this slide really does portray how they want smoke detectors in place. Can you say you have to have bedroom? Yes, we do. That is gone from building code long time ago. It's now in each bedroom. Common places of fire started in bedrooms. You know, and well, that's, that's what we're going to be looking for now. They're going to be in each bedroom. So you're going to still get them. Required to or? Hardwire is only required when uh, you get into doing um, maybe a, a remodel or rebuild and you have access to the framing where you can install them. If it's finished, battery operator is plenty sufficient. So, um, electrical issues. This is one of our handouts for a uh, jumper ground at the water meter. The National Electrical Code does require that water systems be grounded because uh, they are a source of conducting electricity. So, this this jumper ground goes from your panel box to either a copper pipe and then you jumper around the meter where the, the rubber O-rings don't allow conductivity. So the jumper wire 
creates the condu conductivity so you can uh, have a, a ground that goes all the way down. Um, more electrical. This whole thing is electrical pretty much on this section. Anything open, junction boxes, we get them closed. They're, they're one of those items that everybody overlooks, but it is dangerous. You know, you start opening up junction boxes or people start pushing things around, you got loose wires, loose wire nuts, you get sparks, you get grounds, it causes fires. This here is one of those uh, homeowner deals that uh, the guy decided he was going to wire in some lighting and he uh, did some lamp cords from the, the ceiling uh, junction box there, ran it down and put some cords along the grid all that is totally wrong. We get it taken out and we get it fixed. Uh, this is an old, old outlet. They, uh, this is one of those where you could put plugs anywhere on it. It's just not one receptacle outlet. It's kind of a slide where you can drop some in, but they got those two wire nuts out there. They ran wires out there to hook something else up. That'll also get fixed and taken out. Sorry? You probably could. Probably could, but the problem with those things are is you're overfusing what's on that outlet. Probably going to take that wiring and make it very hot and melt the casing. Yeah. Um, wiring that hasn't been terminated, we'll make sure that that's either taken out of there or put in a junction box, sealed up and closed up so it's safe. Broken outlets, we get those fixed. Right off the bat, I mean, you got little kids that are running around putting, you know, playing with uh, outlets, playing with toys. They touch that and they're going to get a shock. They're going to get electrocuted from that. Those get fixed. Another splicing. This is, uh, this is an old uh, type of Romex that was in place back in the 50s and 60s. They uh, just taped some of the ends. One of them has a wire nut. The other one has a piece of tape on it. They just taped them together. We're gonna make sure that's fixed, put in a junction box so it's safe, no one touches it, and no one gets electrocuted from it. This was a really ingenious way of doing something. They cut off the end of a hairdryer cord and they wired in a garbage disposal to it. The cord is only rated for use with a hairdryer. We can't use it as a plug-in cord for running other appliances. That gets taken out of there, wired incorrectly. That would also require an electrical permit to do that. So this is one of those things that uh, it looked nice, it worked fine, but it's wrong. We're gonna get it fixed. Um, this one was just somebody that just didn't finish their job. They kind of left it as is. They didn't put the cover on. They left the wiring hanging out of the box. The little holes on the bottom of the box are where the wiring feeds through. This was just uh, somebody that tried to do their own wiring but really didn't know what they were doing. And here's, uh, this is a really good one. I know you had a question on this one earlier. Uh, this is a open panel box, fuses, which are still fine. You can use fuses. They're they're fine as, as part of today's National Electrical, Co Electrical Code requires. Um, the problem with this is, this is called double lugging right here. They uh, put two wires on one nut. That usually tells us that someone's done their own wiring. It's probably overfused. And uh, it's, it's one of them things that we would make an electrician come in, call out for certification and get corrected on the panel box because now he's got to go through, he's got to check it out to make sure that the fuse can handle the load that's on it. So it's not, it's not just an easy fix all the time. So I don't know where everybody is with electrical, but I personally don't like to do electrical. If I don't know something, I call somebody that does. This one, this, this is part of a slide that was a major, major deal out here. We found this. We can tell what size circuit this was by looking at the size of this uh, pipe coming up here. This was off of a 60 amp service. This has a skinny pipe coming in. 
This is the electrical meter. This is the panel box that it fed. This panel box is still a 60 amp panel box. They put in a 200 amp fuse off of this. So they're trying to run 200 amps off of a 60 amp service. A 60 amp service can actually feed your general power, your general lighting, and maybe one appliance, including your furnace. The rest of the house is powered by gas. So you've got a gas water heater, a gas dryer, a gas stove, and a gas water heater. This house had everything electrical. The furnace had a hot tub, or a, not a hot tub, yeah, it was a hot tub outside. Uh, they had electric water heater, electric stove, electric dryer. Everything in the house was electric, and it also had three different type of breakers that go to three different types of service boxes in it. This thing was so jimmy rigged that it, our electrician was scared to death to open it up because it could blow up on him. The house is uh, actually lucky to be standing, that it didn't burn down. They, uh, they ended up taking out this panel box, putting in a new service, upgrading everything within the house, all the wiring that was uh, jimmy rigged to it, and uh, we got it taken care of. It was uh, a big cost to the bank because the bank didn't want to take this on, but that was their problem. We, you know, they chose, they chose to take this on. They inherited the problem. Uh, extension cords, any permanent, uh, any permanent appliance that's in the house, washer, dryer, uh, sump pump system, garage door openers, anything that powers electricity that's supposed to be within the house is going to have an outlet that goes to it. We're not going to use extension cords to run it. Extension cords are a temporary use. They're not made to, uh, they're not made to be used as permanent wiring. Casing on them is totally different than that of a Romex wire or a Greenfield wiring. It breaks down, it gets brittle. We don't allow that. We make sure an outlet gets in there for it. Um, leads us into plumbing. There's always going to be a lot of questions with backflow prevention and why it's required. It's really to protect the water system, to keep you from getting any contamination introduced into your city or into your system and also into the city's water system. Because all in all, water is supplied by the city, you know, through the utilities division. They have to maintain it, they have to clean it and make sure it comes to you nice and clean so you can drink it. These things protect it. So this one is for a handheld shower, which a lot of the handheld showers nowadays are coming with built-in backflow prevention. There are certain ones out there that don't have it. Uh, the other one there, the gold one, that is for an outside spigot or spigots at laundry tubs. That is, uh, it, it's a pretty easy device that screws on. The set nut at the side keeps it from being screwed off when you're when you're taking the hose off of it. An outside spigot here, this is an unprotected spigot that would get one of those gold backflow preventers, which, uh, by the way, that's, that's a single check valve. We allow a single check valve for those, though our plumbing code requires double check now. So it's a two stage, but we'll allow a single check. Um, other items which uh, we're not going to call out as hazards or corrections, but I want you guys to be aware of because when you get your home inspector coming in and you come back with questions to us, why, why do we not have to fix this now? Our home inspector said we had to fix this. We're going to look at it and tell you it's really not a hazard issue to us. It's not something that we see as detrimental to your health, life, safety, but it's not going to work right. It's totally wrong. This is a kitchen sink, which uh, for the life of me, I don't know how the heck it even drains. It's got so many things wrong. It doesn't have a vent. They glued uh, ABS and, B and PVC, two dissimilar materials together, which you can't do. You can use mechanical fittings on them, but you can't glue them. Um, flex piping down here. This is all sloped differently. It's it's just got so much wrong with it that I don't know how it works, but it managed to work. 
but this would be labeled as what, what our uh, time of sale calls below minimum requirements. So it's just a heads up for you that this is stuff that will come out, it will be found, we do address it, but we don't make you correct it. Another one, S-traps. This also does not have a vent. So we can tell there's no venting on it because of the way it's plumbed. This S-trap is two P-traps put together. And what an S-trap does, it siphons water out so it dries your trap out. It allows for our sewer gas to come back up then. There's no water to seal that trap. This was a beauty. I have no idea how this person made this work, but uh, <laughs> he uh, ran a vacuum cleaner hose to it and just stuffed it into the wall, into the pipe. Uh, again, it was, you could tell it was leaking on the back side there against the wall. There is no P-trap on there. It just ran out and siphoned out. It's an open waste. Again, no P-trap. Plumbing is right, but there's just no P-trap. So it's an open waste. That, those are corrections. Whenever you got an open waste, that's a correction. You need to have shutoffs on everything? Actually, no, shutoffs are not required by our plumbing code. Uh, you got a main shutoff at your <coughs> service entry. That shuts it off so that you can get to your fixtures. It's not a bad idea to, so you don't have to sit there and shut everything down, drain out your whole system. It's not a bad idea to have shutoffs, but it's not required, so we don't enforce those. This one, I have no idea what they were thinking, but they turned everything sideways. He does have a P-trap right there. This tailpiece is supposed to be in the upright position. This is supposed to be in the upright position. They just did it along that way, and. I have no idea how it even managed to work, but it's, it's now an open waste. So uh, I assume they were trying to make more room underneath the cabinet so they could store things. But uh, this is what we see. One of our handouts, this, is, uh, this tells us uh, about the toilet tank. This here is actually a backflow preventer right up in there. That protects you from getting any water into your drinking water system. Because when it's underwater, it can siphon that water out of your tank and bring it back into your drinking water system. So there's always gonna be that one inch air gap right here. That air gap is from the top of the, or from the bottom of that backflow preventer on top of there to that pipe in the center. This is a great example, though it's not a pretty picture. But uh, that valve underneath there, is underwater. That pipe is up in the air. That basically what they'd have to do is they'd have to, uh, depending on the style, some of them are adjustable, some aren't. They would either have to replace it, put a different valve in there, or uh, raise it up if they can. What happens is one of the two valves usually goes bad in the toilet. And uh, people go out and they just buy whatever's available at the store. They get the wrong one that's for the product they have. So if you buy one that's for a Kohler toilet and you have a, an American Standard toilet, they have different sizes for different toilets. So they just get the wrong ones. This, this was, a, this was a, a homeowner that decided he didn't want to put in a plumbing system for his bathroom. He actually brought out, on this pipe, it all runs across the floor, and I've got another slide that goes with this that uh, brings it all together. But uh, he brought a sink out from the backside here, tied it into this pipe. That white pipe is your, uh, your condensate line from the furnace. That goes into that pipe. And on this slide, it's kind of a little hard to see, but this is the pipe coming in and it picks up and dumps into the floor drain. So it's all running across the floor and everything that goes in there dumps into the floor drain. This also is the floor drain, which they took the, which one is that? It's this hole. Took the clean out plug out. Actually, no, it's this hole. That's a clean out plug for it. Clean out plug 
is there so that you can snake out the line, get any roots, debris out, any clogs out, so that your plumbing system flows freely. Um, without that cleanup plug in there, it's straight shot right into the sewer system. So you can get sewer gas coming in, you can get any rodents that make their way through. You see, you, you can go outside and watch um, uh, raccoons go down into the sewer system. There's mice in the sewer system. There's snakes in the sewer system. They have open access into your house without the cleanup plug there. Chances are they're not gonna come in there, but they're there. So it's one of those things you still gotta get in place. Water, uh, this is a water heater. Uh, the temperature pressure relief valve on a water heater is very important. If a water heater does malfunction, it can become a rocket and take off and blow your house right off the foundation. The temperature pressure relief valve is there to, if, to protect that water heater. If it, uh, if it does malfunction and it produces too much hot water and gets to the point where it wants to take off that valve, will usually dump the water onto the floor so it doesn't become a combustible rocket. This is installed wrong because on these, it's got to be within six inches of the top of this tank right here, either on the top or on the side, to go inside that water that's in the tank. It senses the water temperature at 210 degrees so that it knows that if it reaches 210 degrees, it dumps that valve out there and dumps it to the floor. So your, your water heater does not become a rocket. This is outside the water heater, so your outside air is cooling that water off really fast. So it's, it's improperly installed, that's a correction, we're gonna make sure it gets fixed. Uh, this is a, a hand pump to a well. This was in a garage. This here has a spigot on it. So even wells do require backflow prevention. We're gonna install a little backflow preventer on it. Um, again, with wells, it's also an environmental issue. We have, uh, we have people out there that want to use their wells for irrigation. So we make sure that they're separated from city water. So with this, it's really not an issue of separating this type of a well. This one can be used for uh, general watering outside. They can use it to wash their cars. They can use it to water their lawn and stuff. It's really not an issue, but if it's not in use, our environmental department would make sure it gets abandoned and sealed. They take on that part of the wells. Another well inside of a house. This here is the pressure tank, your pump. This well hasn't been in service for many, many years. It's uh, probably a 15 year old well that's just been sitting there. It's, I guarantee you it's seized up. It's not even functional. Our environmental department usually will take this on. They'll make sure that these things get sealed. All the equipment gets abandoned. They uh, fill the casing with fine grout or bentonite. Make sure it's sealed for that so you can't get contaminated water or contaminated products going into the aquifer system down below. Gas lines, one of our handouts for gas lines. We, uh, we require now, because our gas code requires that any appliance connector that you use for gas has to be stainless steel. All other products have been eliminated from it with the exception of copper, um, black iron piping, galvanized piping, CSST, which is also a stainless steel. It's got a plastic casing on it though. Um, those products are okay to use. These appliance connectors here that we find, they're usually uh, brass. The ones that are out there are still brass. There's some that are aluminum yet, which we can't use either. So we make sure they get taken out and replaced. This is a stainless steel gas connector. This is what is out there for use with appliances. You can, uh, you can take these things and hook them up. That allows you to pull your stove or whatever appliance is movable in and out. 
though they do still recommend that you unhook them before you pull them in and out, but you can pull them in and out. They have the flexibility without breakage. This is one of the old ones. This is a brass one. So this brass one here would get taken out. They didn't cap it at the end there. We're gonna get all that fixed. So none of that's gonna even be there. If they wanna use gas, they're gonna take off with a new connector, stainless steel, and they can hook up the appliance at that time. If they're not gonna use a gas appliance at that point, we'll make sure it gets capped. We don't wanna trust shutoff valves to be the only source of shutting off gas. Open gas line here. This also is an older uh, shutoff valve. It's called a spindle valve. Those, as long as they're still working, they're still usable, they can remain in place. They are a type of valve that does require maintenance though. So they have to be oiled, maintained, make sure that they turn on and off and they're working properly. We don't make anybody take those things out until they're not usable at that point then they have to be replaced. Another, uh, another beautiful uh, slide here that for the life of me, I don't know what these people were thinking, but uh, your plastic gray piping that comes up with the black uh, uh, 120 degree fittings, those are for your plumbing venting. It's supposed to go through the roof, but these people obviously didn't want to put another hole in their roof, so they decided to snake on some, uh, some flexible vent connectors. They tied in a, a bath fan to it, and they ran it up to this here piece of hard piping coming up, and it goes into the roof. Your plumbing venting is required to go through the roof. It is something we will make you correct and make you fix. It keeps your where, where you don't have venting, you're gonna find that you're gonna have a lot of uh, clogs in your plumbing system. Your water's gonna drain very slowly. It's, it's more of a sanitary issue at this point. Um, mechanical venting, it'll also get corrected. They'll throw, a, they'll throw a vent termination on the roof there. They'll hook the piping up correctly that way. All of that will get fixed. This was, uh, I have no idea why they did this, but this is a garage. They put a furnace in the garage. They stacked three uh, masonry blocks up there and set it on top. And the car pulled in and used to bump the furnace. It wasn't that big of a garage. So when he hit the furnace, he knew he was already in the garage. <laughs> I, I kind of had to chuckle on that because I'm surprised Nothing ever happened with that. The guy was very careful with it. But uh, that is also something that, by code, this is an improper installation. First of all, this has to be properly supported. Make sure that it's, it can be standing in place without it coming down because now he's compromising the gas line. He's compromising the venting on it and also the electrical that goes to it. So if he hits it a little too hard with the car, it's going down. We address structural issues. Um, basically, this is a slide of a deck. And I, the other pictures that went with it weren't good enough to put on the slide, so I'm gonna explain what I got here. Basically, these plinth blocks, they sit on top of a retaining wall. Now, the retaining wall does not have footings. It's just holding back dirt. That's all it's doing. You can see by the crack here, it's already failed pretty much. Now when you get a winter like this and frost knows no limits, it pushes that wall out. There goes your uh, footing, whatever footing there really was. This was all the way around on the deck supporting the whole deck. We we're gonna make sure that they get footings in there. We're gonna make sure they get support posts in there or they can take the deck off and block off the door. One of the two. But we don't want to have decks falling down, people on them. You've heard of all the collapses from decks, probably in the news, uh, recent and probably in the past five years, it's probably been out there where 
they've made sure that the public knows about that stuff. We're going to make sure this gets fixed. This is a foundation wall that's also a structural foundation wall. I can see daylight through all these cracks. They tried to caulk it up, but this is, this is caused by hydrostatic pressure. This is caused because the soils cannot withstand the water that goes into them, and it eventually has to push the wall in. If the wall isn't reinforced properly, they, nowadays we use rebar inside of walls so that it can hold that pressure. These walls don't have them. A lot of the homes out here don't have rebar in the walls because they're 1950s homes. Um, it, it's one of those things here that this, this pressure pushed the wall in, now it's compromising the structure itself. So at this point, their fix is to either um, bring a contractor in, he's going to come with us, uh, figure out some type of solution as to how to fix this wall. Maybe he's going to open up the cores and drop some rebar and cement it in. Maybe it's going to involve some uh, outside products where they've got uh, a mat system that can go on the wall and withstand the pressure. They've got uh, posts that they can put up there to hold that wall in place. They've got, uh, they've got a whole slew of things out there nowadays to correct items like this. Well, it's a very good question. Um, we, you have a very wet spring. You're on clay soil. Your clays can only hold so much water, and then it starts to expand and expand and expand. It expands until it finds a weak point in it, and that weak point just happens to be the wall. And it pushes that wall in and pops the block. And as it, as it gets more and more water, this is what it does. It keeps pushing and pushing and pushing until sometimes it fails. I've seen walls like this already out three or four inches from the block, so I mean the block is actually staggered. Mostly clays. Sandy soils are a very well-draining soil. They do not require any kind of uh, um, sump pump system to go with them, but putting them in is also a safeguard for you. But in clay soils, that's where a sump pump system comes in. It takes the water out and kind of reduces the pressure coming back on this. So it's recycling water in and out. As it comes in, it pulls it out and it lets the soils drain out as it can. It's, it's mostly plain water. Freeze cycle, that will do even more damage to this. Ice knows no boundaries. This winter is probably one of our I'd say our worst winters in, I don't know, 30 years. Um, ice is, is kind of like a strong man pushing, it, pushing on something that you can't control. It doesn't have a limit to the amount of pressure it can put on there. They can't really design anything for ice because as it expands, it can go this way, it can go this way, it can go this way. So it, it is one of those things where ice Ice could blow this wall right in easily. We just had a house out here not too long ago that they uh, put a product on called the Reinforcer. Uh, it was some fiberglass uh, sheets, kind of like, uh, kind of like strips that they epoxied onto the wall. Um, it had the same thing going. The wall had a bow in it, probably three inches, and it was just coming in like a nice bow and arrow arc. Uh, what they had going on with that, it was a bearing wall and also the driveway was there. So getting back to the ice thing, as you drive on your driveway, it drives frost down and it gets it deeper and deeper and deeper. So with no snow cover, you'll just drive that frost down farther and farther and farther. So this, that's where it becomes kind of a, a hairy situation on the type of fix that they use for those type of walls. It's, it's not out of the question that they can fix them, but it's providing the right fix for the environment.
hope you can see this one, but this is also something that this is uh, our utilities gets involved in this this part of it. Sump pumps. Um, sump pumps do uh, take out the water from the foundation. They make sure it gets drained out so you don't have failing walls. But you can't dump them into city water system, into your city drainage system. It has to go to the exterior. The slide on the end there shows that pipe going up. It's coming down here and dumping into a laundry tub. They'll either dump it into a laundry tub, the floor drain, whatnot. We're going to make sure, or our utilities division will make sure that it gets taken and put to the outside and they can drain outside onto the free soil that's out there already and it's got space where it takes care of it on its own. Right now our city, uh, our city sewers are not sized to capacity basically to handle the discharge of sump pumps being dumped into them along with the usage of the home. So it creates more of a problem for uh, our utilities division on that side because they're trying to figure out how to unclog all these all these sewers that have all this stuff coming into them. So, well, that was the end of the slides. Questions? Yes. Uh, you don't have to have a double shut off on it. It's it's got two coming in. One is the street side, which is uh, your first shut off valve down low. Your second is the house side. So if you're if you're trying to um, say say you don't have any shut off valves on any of your appliances and you're changing out a water heater, you for safety you're gonna shut both shut off valves off, but you you don't have to shut off the city side. You can shut off the house side. That's the higher valve up there. So yeah, there's always usually two of them on there. Yes, sir. Yes, we, we did go over electrical quite a bit. Um, and to elaborate on that too, Anything with electrical, as far as you're going to have your jumper for your panel box ground, and that's also going to be a two-part system. We're going to make sure there's a ground wire coming out of your panel box, and we're going to make sure there's a jumper going across the meter. So that, that is your ground for your panel box. Um, as far as any copper piping that goes in place with that jumper, it grounds the water piping system in your house so it doesn't have energizing power to it. Um, missing cover plates, open junction boxes, stuff like that where people can stick their fingers in. You know, it's kind of like touching wet paint. You put your hand up there, is this wet? Well, a lot of people do the same thing with electrical. What's that hole for? And they stick their finger in there and they wonder why they get shocked. We're gonna make sure you got knockout plugs. We're gonna make sure that uh, junction boxes are covered up. If you got any openings at the panel box, those openings are gonna get closed up too. You're gonna get knockout plugs. Uh, maybe the breaker can go back in place. Maybe it's not, a, not a, an opening that uh, is being used. They could put a breaker in place. It's a dead breaker basically, but it closes up the opening. That's allowed. Other questions? Um, yeah, you have to sell your house Yes. Well, no. <laughs> you don't have to sell the house within one year of inspection. Um, I can't say that you have to do that, but the inspection is only good for one year. So what, I, what I've found is a lot of people will list their house, they'll get the inspection. The house doesn't sell, maybe it takes two years. In the meantime, what they've done is because a lot of people have told them, oh, you've got to upgrade this, you've got to do this, you've got to do this. So they start doing certain things in the house. They create more problems because they try to do it themselves and they don't know what they're doing. They create more problems where we already signed off that, yes, items were corrected. Now they have a new inspection and some other things were found. Well, it just happens that it's things that they did, but they didn't do them right again. You know, they created more 
hazardous situations within the house. The report is only good for one year. So we require that you'd have to get another time of sale report. We do allow a one month grace period on it. You know, it's kind of, if you've got a, a sale pending, but it doesn't close for about three or four months, but the sale happened within that year, we're okay with that. Is there a inspection? The city does it. Uh, we charge 185 for the inspection. We're right in the middle of the ballpark. We have a list of private evaluators out there that do inspections and uh, we don't keep track of their prices. They range all over the board. And is your You're actually supposed to have an inspection done prior to listing. So it's it's not that hard to time it. It depends on the time of year. I mean, uh, as far as, you know, y you watch the real estate market go and usually it's the spring previews that really start the market going again. So you, you kind of got to weigh your time period out and make sure that you're, you call in. And uh, it, you, you can probably get it next day. You could probably get it where, yeah, we're booked out for a couple of days. It might be a week later. So. Sir. I know the city's not in a position to make referrals, but when you need a contractor, is there any checklist of things? I mean, most of these mistakes are because someone did it themselves, but there are those contractors that, you know, don't know what they're doing. You're right. As far as any guidelines or checklist of getting a good, competent contractor for electrical plumbing that come um, to mind, other than the business bureau and, and neighbors referral? Yeah, I, you know, that's a tough one from a homeowner or a home seller. It's a tough one for us too because even some of the good contractors out there, sometimes they like to cheat the system a little bit and they see the, see a job as, you know, this is a quick in and out and maybe they, they miss something that they should have done. Wherever they come in, they should always check to make sure, that, is this something that needed a permit to do? You know, you have a contractor come in and say he wanted to throw in some or you guys wanted to put your house up for sale and he decided you decided you wanted to throw in some uh, ground fault interrupter outlets at your your kitchens and bathrooms and you wanted to um, change out some lighting and stuff those would require permits so whenever you get a contractor that says yeah I'll do it and he just comes in doesn't call for inspection doesn't get a permit you kind of got to weigh your odds there. It's up to you to make sure that he follows the proper procedures and orders. So if it requires a permit, she gets inspected after the insurance. That's your insurance, yeah. Inspections are your insurance on whether it's done right or not. It's your paper trail to you making sure that things within the house and work that you have done are done to building codes, national electrical code, plumbing codes, gas, mechanical, all of that. Now we do check out furnaces. We make sure furnaces are um, functional and they, they, don't, uh, they don't have any of what we call little telltale signs of problems within it. Uh, we have a list in our guidelines that kind of tell us which way to go on that certifications would be required if we find something on that list. And usually the telltale sign to that is when you get a furnace that's burning with a really wild flame. You know, a nice blue flame is a perfect tuned furnace. When it's orangish red and it's just very wild and rapid, that's a telltale sign that the furnace is either out of tune, it's got a cracked exchanger, or it, it's, it's not properly getting the amount of air that's needed to get that blue flame, which goes back to tuning. So, I mean, there's, there's telltale signs for it. We ask for certifications on furnace if we see signs of something wrong with the furnace. We ask for certifications on electrical when we see uh, on one of those pictures that I showed you where we see double lugging on the, on the service. When we see other things that are improperly wired and put together maybe maybe someone's decided that they're going to do their basement and finish it off themselves and 
you start seeing all these just little signs that this wasn't done by a professional, but it's not right. You can ask for a certification on that. They'll make sure that an electrician comes in there, gets it uh, taken care of, corrected, and then we can move on from there. So structural certifications too, like that failing wall. That's kind of our insurance policy that the wall gets fixed. When we ask for a certification, we're asking that a licensed contractor come in, give us a fix, and then we go from there. Yes? What about radon? Wow, tough one. Radon is in our code. It made it into our building code, uh, the last code cycle. Um, it is something that it is required within the state now, though we don't enforce radon. The only time it's enforced is when we have a new home going up, or maybe, uh, maybe they've taken a home and you know, they've put an addition on it. That's when we make sure that maybe at some point we have a radon system installed. It can be either passive or active. An active system has the fan that's already installed on it and it's going to have its outlet to run that fan all the time. Passive system is a system that doesn't have a fan, but it's basically the gas that can come up and out the pipe and out the roof. It's not required yet, not by time of sale. Uh, it's really, I, I don't even know if it's a big deal. It depends on who you talk to. It depends on who you talk to. The state does have some little mock-ups on it on how radon works. Um, they've, they've kind of uh, dissected it to a point where they kind of figured it out. But a lot of people coming from out state, that it's very important out there where they require radon inspections. What radon is, is decay. It's decay underground. And it's off-gassing into the house. So any cracks in your floor, uh, it can even come through foundation walls because the block is porous. It can come through there. That's, that's where radon gas really becomes more of an issue. Um, we don't really address radon. We don't address lead. We don't address asbestos. So that's one of the things that eventually it does get taken care of but if you don't touch it, it's not really a problem. Um, as far as radon goes, um, when you have tests done on radon, uh, there's a limit on the amount of radon that comes into a home. They do make you not open any windows, not open any doors other than what you're doing normally. They have a little machine down there that tests the amount of radon that's in there. Um, I, it's a four, Pascal, I believe, is what the number is on there. If it's over that, you need a radon system. But we don't, in it, we don't get into that for time of sale. So nobody requires it? No, not unless it's a new construction. Then it's required and we check for it at that point. No, it's not. Your home inspector, when they come in there for the buyer, they will probably and most likely have their radon check at that time. Yes, sir. Are there any homes that radon? Oh yeah, yeah. There's there's quite a few of them, you know. And and usually when you find these homes, they're in areas where uh, the soil conditions are more of clay, a silt, a little bit of a muck, not in a sand location. So there's pockets of that. Bloomington is usually a pretty good area for sandy soil all the way around here, but there are pockets of soil conditions that are really unfavorable to radon. It can't make it through, the gas can't make it through the clay soils, so it finds its other way through. Kind of like water, finds a path of least resistance. Yes, ma'am. How prevalent? Yeah, there's a lot of homes that still have sump pumps. I, I think that's, uh, that's one of the things that people are very aware of nowadays. They want sump pump systems in their homes. There's a lot of homes out there that, you know, grading is, is an issue with, with water and it's always going to 
um, when, when you don't have the proper grading, you know, and it comes back against the home, that's when you get water in your basement. A lot of people have fixed that problem by either installing a sump pump along the area that, you know, a drainage system, sump pump system along the area where the water's coming in, or they've taken that grating and they've drained it so it goes out into the yard so that it can carry that water out. So there's quite a few of them in here. Yes. Sure. There's, you know, that, that goes back to your realty uh, transaction. Um, you can sell a home as is. Now with time of sale, we're going to come in and tell you the corrections that are there. Okay. If you can't afford to do them, or you decide you don't want to do them, maybe this is a, a house that's been in trust for the family, the people that passed away, and this family is just looking to get rid of the house. They don't want to fix anything. People can come in, buy the house the way it is. They can fill out a form with us at the city that these items of correction are still out there and have to be addressed. They'll take the responsibility for filling that out and for correcting that, uh, those items. What we'll do is we'll make sure that, you know, we have inspections set up so that we can come in there and view those items have been corrected. So it, we, don't, we don't make it impossible for you to sell your home. We just try to make it so that you can sell your home in a, you know, as a safe home. I'm in at the bottom of these handouts. Where do you get those? Down at our community development uh, counter. It's uh, down the hallway at the very lower level there towards the uh, vending room. There's a whole bunch of handouts, a whole bunch of people there that are willing to answer any kind of questions you have. What, what level of inspection does the city do pertaining to the, the water in the basement issue where <coughs> someone has a problem, you know, they paint a wall to cover it up and somebody you can see the mold and the moisture still coming through and of course the big hesitation is do you have a water problem or not? I know you can't certify that it's okay, but yeah, that's, yeah. that's an expensive fix. It is, and we note it. There's, you know, on the report, there's always going to be notations of, you know, water damage or maybe mold, uh, stuff like that on there. Uh, those are signs of water damage. We note it, but, you know, most of it can be taken care of by proper grading. So with that, we don't, cor we don't require correction on that. We do note it so that the next person has that in front of them that says, hey, you know what, there's been some water damage here. Their home inspector can dig into it a little deeper and take moisture tests and see if there is actually water getting into the walls. They, they can see what's going on there. Um, also, we do check sanitation as part of it. Our sanitation does involve infestation by vermin, by rats, by mice, cockroaches, the whole darn thing. So, I mean, uh, I, I've, I've seen it out here. It's not uh, immune to this community at all. It's in every community. A lot of the stuff comes in off of the foods that we buy and uh, some of the stuff that comes through some of what people grow at home. So, with that, we get that stuff taken care of too. If there is we don't check for bed bugs. No, that's a whole other story. Yes, ma'am. Is the um, flexible for a gas dryer with a venting? Is flexible uh, venting tube? Uh, does that still pass, or does it have to be the rigid type of uh, venting? Um, we had a slide on there for some of the flexible tubing. In that slide, it did show some of that bright, shiny uh, piping. That is still allowed. That is, uh, there's actually three products out there that are for uh, dryer venting. One is the rigid piping, just like the same ducting that you have on your water heater usually. Um, the other is a flexible aluminum. It's kind of like a, a hard slinky. It's, it's flexible. You can kind of rotate it around and get the bends in it you need. Uh, that one is allowed. There's also one that's gone through Underwriter Laboratory listing. They've tested it for dryers, and it's 
an aluminum foil style. It's a heavy gauge aluminum foil style that is allowed. A lot of the stuff that you'll see out there, they sell it, but you can't use it. So you can go in and find this little box that says dryer venting for your dryer. You can't use plastic. You can't use the thin aluminum foil style. You can't use them. You can buy them, but you can't use them. It's the same thing with a lot of piping. When you replace your water heater, you'll see that they sell these pre-made temperature pressure relief valve uh, drain pipes that come down. They're white. You can't use them, but they can sell them. See, we have what we call here free trade in the United States. Everybody can bring in products that they want to sell. We have to allow it, but we can't always use it. So you got to be careful what you buy. So you'll have a lot of people trying to sell you stuff that you can't use. Well, well, actually, plastic you can't have, but from flexible uh, piping. You can start it out with flexible. You can have up to eight feet of flexible. The rest can be metal. Uh, technically, our mechanical code does require that it can only have a maximum of 25 feet of vent piping. So the problem is, you don't know what's inside the hard wall going to the outside thing. Well, that's where you can see it from the outside. When you look in, yeah, you open the flap and you can look in with a flashlight and see what it is. You'll also see that, you know, where it takes off from the dryer and goes up in the ceiling, you can probably see where that piping is. What's, what's buried behind walls, we can't enforce, you know, but that's it. Um, actually, our time is up, so if you do have any other questions, feel free to come down to our community development counter and uh, we'll answer any questions that you do have. Plenty of handouts out there for everybody. Thank you. Thank you.